apologize at the beginning. This is not an astronomy club, there aren't a lot of pretty pictures. Um, I figure if I can't show equations and talk about sophisticated stuff, that the Canadian Institute can do it out of the last one, because it's kind of a So, this is going to be a highly technical talk. I hope it's not too boring. I actually think it's extremely useful. So I'm going to tell you about later on the talk, something called total angular momentum waves, a new formalism that the uh, student postdoc and I have developed. Um, to discuss cosmological perturbations. And um, I remember when I was a graduate student, my advisor was trying to turn a sticker for grammar. And he taught me a number of things that were useful. And one of the things that he taught me that has turned out to be a curse is the difference between that and which. Because now, every time I read a paper, people always use, misuse that and which. And I can't get past it. Anytime I read a paper, I get stuck with the that's and which is the word is my life would have been a lot more pleasant. And the reason I thought of this is that just about every day in the archive, a paper shows up. Don't read the on my co-authors, and I look at that, and I think, God, that would have been much easier to be done, much more easily done with total angle momentum. And half the time, the you on know, goes and starts to does the calculation, but you can't be doing nothing except writing, rewriting papers. This form was. Anyway, it is a very powerful form of wisdom. So the title is covering the bases, not bases, but the change of basis, the change of multiple bases. That's the title of the talk. Um, I'm actually going to start though with something else, a paper from last year um, with Don Richon called Clustering Processes. It actually is analogous or similar or related or follows on um, work that was done here by Mr. David Pell. And then I'll go into this total angle momentum wave formalism. And then I'll discuss, I'll give you a few applications of this total angle momentum wave formalism and cosmology so you can see um, a few examples of how it may be useful. So those of you who are students or postdocs, collaborate senior people, know this is the work. Um, Don Green is a postdoc. Um, he was a student at the University of Texas with the Ichiro Komatsu, and was supposed to be came to Caltech and they came to John Thompson a few years ago. And Leon Dai is a second year graduate student at Johns Hopkins. So I'm going to start with a brief review of inflation. I'm assuming that most of the people in the audience are quite familiar with the theory of inflation. So in inflation, we introduce an input time field, phi of x. Fluctuations in that input time field give rise to the curvature curvature. And the curvature is some other function, zeta of x. That curvature perturbation is related through the Poisson equation, or actually, sorry, through a factor of five thirds, the curvature perturbation is the same thing as what we ordinarily think of as the Newtonian gravitational potential phi, and that Newtonian gravitational potential is related to the density perturbation through the Poisson equation. So, if I talk about an input time fluctuation, curvature perturbation, density perturbation, or potential perturbation, they're all the same thing. And what's important here is that they are all scalar fields. They don't have any indices. Each of them takes on a value at a given space-time point. It doesn't point in any given direction. Inflation makes a number of predictions. So one of them is the prediction for primordial density perturbations. And the way this is done is as follows. We take the scalar field, here the impliton phi of x, and we construct the square root components. And inflation predicts that if I take two, any two Fourier amplitudes, phi of k and phi of k prime, the complex conjugate here, and ask what is the expectation value of the product of those two different Fourier amplitudes, inflation predicts that the product, the expectation value of the product, is zero unless k is equal to k prime. In other words, that Fourier mode and that Fourier mode are statistically independent. If I look at an individual Fourier mode, phi of k, its variance is given by this function p sub phi of k, which is the power spectrum. So the power spectrum is the variance of the expectation value of the square in the field of the given Fourier mode. And inflation also predicts that the different Fourier modes, the different Fourier mode amplitudes are statistically independent. Inflation also makes a number of further predictions. It predicts at lowest order 
that the expectation value of the product of any n for a m to is phi 1, phi 2, all the way up to phi in the case of n is 0 if n is odd. And it also predicts that the endpoint correlation function, the expectation value for the product of an even number of Fourier modes, is trivially related to the power spectrum. So, for example, the four point correlation function is what particle theorists would call the disconnected correlation function. So, it's just a, a sum of the power spectrum for K1 and K2 plus the permutations plus the sum um, delta. <coughs> now, all of this follows because the action or the infliton during inflation can be written in the following way. It is simply the Einstein action for the gravitational field plus the usual action for a scalar field, a kinetic term and a potential term. And when you write this action in terms of Fourier modes, what you can show, this has been done for years, but it's shown most eloquently probably in the model summit paper, the action then winds up being written in terms of Fourier modes as a sum over um, each of the different Fourier modes of the curvature perturbation squared plus the time derivative of the curvature perturbation squared. So if you look at this, you'll see that this is a sum of actions for independent simple harmonic oscillators. Each zeta sub k, each Fourier amplitude for the curvature perturbation for the scalar field perturbation evolves as if it were an independent simple harmonic oscillator <laughs> of frequency k squared. Now when you do take this, um, action and expand to higher order of zeta, <coughs> we'll find cubic terms. But the lowest order is a bunch of uncoupled simple harmonic oscillators. And in quantum field theory, we write this as a propagator, a straight line. But as I said, there are cubic corrections. And these cubic corrections exist even if there are no cubic terms in the potential for the scalar field. So even if there's no scalar field potential, or if there aren't any cubic terms in the scalar field potential, you still get cubic terms in the action for mixing of the scalar field with the scalar modes of the metric theory, or of, the, of the metric. So the metric has 10 components, four of them are gauge degrees of freedom, the remaining six degrees of freedom can be wrote as two scalar degrees of freedom, two vector degrees of freedom, and two tensor degrees. And what you find is that the scalar degrees of freedom in the metric, the phi inside the metric perturbation variables, mix with the scalar field. And that gives rise to cubic terms. So the prediction of inflation, more precisely, is that the product of the expectation value of three density perturbation <coughs> amplitudes, or scalar field amp or scalar field amplitudes or curvature amplitudes, the product of any three of these is non-zero, more precisely. It is proportional to a bispectrum, B of K1, K2, K3, where K1, K2, and K3 are the magnitudes of the wave vectors K1, K2, and K3. And the fact that it depends only on the magnitudes of K1, K2, and K3 is a consequence of statistical isotropy. A bispectrum for a Fourier amplitude K1 in this direction should be the same as the amplitude for a bispectrum for a Fourier one in this direction, if there's no other direction. And then this is what quantum field, the particle there's what we call the momentum conserving delta function. So this bispectrum is non-zero only if k1 plus k2 plus k3, the four Fourier vectors, add up to zero. They form a triangle in k space. And in particle theory, you would call this a momentum conserving delta function. In cosmology, this is a consequence of statistical isotropy. They're both the same. So you can calculate this bispectrum in the single field slow roll inflation, the standard kinetic term, which is the simplest canonical lowest order um, inflation model. And realistically, this bispectrum amplitude is small in single field slow roll inflation. But it may be big in models for inflation beyond single field, single field slow roll. Okay, so if you browse the literature over the past decade, astro pH, sometimes F pH or half pH, on any random day, you will see some paper with some inflationary model discussing non gas unity, EBI models, perviton models, etc. So here's how we represent the bispectrum in cosmology. This is cosmologies. That's the word for the language that cosmologists speak. So 
So the bias spectrum is a function of the triangle. It's a function of K1, K2, K3, where K1, K2 are the three Fourier amplitudes, and they have to sum up to, put, to form to a closed triangle. And as I said before, um, the bias spectrum does not depend on the orientation. I forgot my uh, graphic. Does anybody have a piece of paper with a visible pen? Anybody's got a piece of paper? Please draw a triangle. I have In particle theory, this is how we represent a bias spectrum. It is a three-point correlation function for the curvature perturbation. <laughs> so that is what you see on our guide for the past 10 years. But there's more that inflation can, and in fact, does predict. <laughs> so if we go back to that Lagrangian, that Lagrangian term, that Lagrangian can name, contain a kinetic term for the scalar field, del mu phi, del mu phi. But to contract del mu and del nu, we need to introduce a metric tensor, g mu nu. And g mu nu is a gravitational field. And in general relativity, that gravitational field is dynamical. And so there is a three-point correlation between the gravitational fields and two scalar perturbation fields. So there is a tensor scalar scalar three-point correlation function, or tensor um, scalar scalar pi spectrum in standard single field small row inflation. We're not adding any new field to the theory. This is a generic prediction of single field small row inflation. And this tensor metric perturbation is a gravitational fail. Sorry. So we need to figure out if we want to Field C, in addition to the scalar field phi, which is the input. 
In that case, you would have a three-point vertex, which might show up, for example, in exchange of a virtual seed as a four-point correlation of the five. And this actually has shown up, for example, in models by uh, Bauman and Green for supersymmetric equation and other papers before that. It's also conceivable that there might be some spectator spin two fields. E mu nu, maybe there's some other field in addition to H mu nu, the biometric theory for the gravity, for example, in which case the scalar field, the infotonic, could be coupled in this new spin two field. So the point of this paper that Dominic Jong and I wrote was to simply postulate, wow, this is bad, um, no, no, sorry, equations there, I was worried about this class. <laughs> so what Dominic and I did is simply postulate that there is some new field around during inflation in addition to the income that couples to the infoton. And that new field could be a scalar field, a vector field, or a tensor field. And the point of this paper was to investigate how it is that you would look for such a coupling um, in galaxy surface. So we imagine that the scalar field, that this new fossil field, scalar vector or tensor fossil field, couples to the infoton. And if the infoton gives rise to density perturbations, and if the infoton has coupling to some new field, then it could be that there would be uh, there could be correlations between these different Fourier modes of the infoton field induced. So this is how it works. We parameterize most generally the coupling to the new field in terms of a density density new field or fossil field three point function delta k one delta k two k to the capital k. Statistical isotropy for the entire system requires that we have this momentum conserving delta function. There's going to be some power spectrum, piece of P, for the new field of polarization P. There's going to be some clustering amplitude, or three-point correlation function, F sub P. And then there's going to be a polarization vector that dots into K1i, K2j. So here, this is fully generic, and P here could be either tensor metric perturbation, that, sorry, tensor, one of the two tensor polarizations, plus or cross. One of the two vector polarizations, x or y, and I'll show you on the, the next slide what these look like. So if I have such a three-point correlation function, and then I imagine that there's some realization of this new field, this new gravitational wave field, this gravitational wave field with respect to the field, that in the presence of some realization of this field specified by its Fourier component, H of K, capital K, the two-point correlation function for the density perturbation, the thing that we see will now no, no longer be diagonal, but it will have off-diagonal terms. And it will have off-diagonal terms that are non-zero for k1 plus k2 equals minus k. And it will have some amplitude that's related to the bispectrum for the scalar-scalar tensor correlation function. So in the presence of this new vector tensor scalar field, the two-point correlation function for density perturbations in Fourier space will no longer be diagonal. So here are the polarization tensors that are possible. So plus and cross are the two polarizations of a tensor perturbation. So if I have a tensor perturbation and gravitational wave propagating along this direction, the space-time can be squeezed and, squeezed and stretched in the x direction or in the cross direction. So this represents the two um, polarization of a tensor perturbation. A vector perturbation, or a vector field, has a, a polarization vector that's either x or y. So if I have an electromagnetic wave, for example, propagating in the z direction, the electric field either oscillates in the x direction or it oscillates in the y direction. And then there are the two scalar modes. And the two scalar modes are a longitudinal compression or an overall scalar. And I actually have a picture, which is nice on the next slide, but what I want to point out here is that all of these can be distinguished by their behavior under a rotation um, about phi. So this is the central point of this part of the talk. The central point of this part of the talk is that if I have some new field, and I like it, look at one Fourier mode of this new field in this direction over here, and then I ask, 
what is the three-point correlation function between this Fourier mode and two Fourier modes in the scalar field, K1 and K2, it's going to have some functional dependence on the magnitude of K, K1 and K2. But there's going to be an additional dependence, that depend, an additional dependence that depends on whether this new field is a scalar vector or tensor field. So if this is a scalar perturbation, then it must have azimuthal direction, azimuthal symmetry about the direction of propagation. And so, if this is the K mode right here, the bias vector for this triangle will be the same as the bias vector for this triangle, and this triangle, and this triangle. On the other hand, if this mode is a vector field, then there will be a sine phi or cosine phi dependence of the three point function about the rotation about a, in, the, in the phi direction, as a neutral direction. So if this is a vector field over here, and these are the two density perturbation modes, then this bias spectrum, this three point function, will have the opposite sign of this three point function. And if this is a tensor perturbation, then this three-point function will have the opposite sign of this one. It will have the same sign as this one. It will have an opposite sign as this three-point function. So the scalar vector and tensor fields will induce three-point functions between the new field and the two density perturbation modes that depend on this azimuthal angle phi with either a cosine or sine 2 phi dependence and it's a tensor perturbation sine or cosine phi dependence or um, no azimuthal dependence of the scalar perturbation. And so what we're pointing out in this paper is that if I measure a four-point function for the density perturbation, that four-point function, a four-point function is two triangles, and the four-point function, usually we write it on a flat surface as a quadrilateral, but the three-dimensional space, that four-point function actually has some dependence on an angle that, uh, about a diagonal angle. And what we're pointing out is that if it's a scalar perturbation, then that four-point function and that four-point function and that four-point function will all have the same sign, will all have the same magnitude. But if it's a vector perturbation, then this four-point function will have the opposite sign of this four-point function. And if it's a tensor perturbation, then this four-point function will have the opposite sign of this four-point function and this four-point function. So by measuring the dependence of the four-point correlation function on the azimuthal angle about the diagonal, you can distinguish geometrically between coupling and new field to scalar vector tensor field. So I think I've said most of what's on this slide, but one more time. The polarization tensor epsilon to the pij is a three by three tensor most generally, three by three symmetric tensor most generally, has six degrees of freedom. And that includes two scalar degrees of freedom, two vector degrees of freedom, two tensor degrees of freedom. So again, the scalar degrees of freedom are a overall scaling, a longitudinal component. The two vector degrees of freedom are the two different polarizations of the vector field, and the tensor are the two different polarizations of the tensor field. And then we made some pictures. Sorry, movies. We made some movies of what these look like. So this is supposed to be the direction of the tensor perturbation, or actually the, the perturbation, scalar vector tensor perturbation. And this actually shows you what h plus and h cross look like. So these represent quadrilateral, sorry, um, quadrupolar distortions of an otherwise symmetric sphere. So this is the crest, trough, crest, trough of the field. And over here, I have a sphere, but if that sphere that runs into this tensor mode, it gets stretched out and then it becomes spherical on the crest of the wave, and then on the next trough, it uh, is um, elongated in the opposite direction. And this is the same thing, rotated by 45 degrees into the movie, they're both the same thing. This is what the scalar perturbation, the two scalar perturbation modes look like. One of them is an overall scaling of the sphere, so if I had a sphere and I had one of these waves into the dunnet, that sphere becomes smaller, same size, bigger, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other scalar mode represents a longitudinal compression. Something looks like a sound wave. The sphere gets stretched out, becomes spherical, and then it gets squashed in along the direction of propagation. And the vector mode is the same thing. This one you don't see quite as often. So this represents a quadrupolar distortion along a direction that's 45 degrees with respect to the direction of propagation. 
So, for example, if you had a theory of um, alternative gravity where it had propagating vector metric perturbations, and you had a, a sphere of test masses, this is what would happen to that sphere of test masses over time. And again, these are um, the same thing, but off by many degrees. <coughs> Uh, the other thing I don't have a picture for is you can also construct um, right and left circularly polarized um, polarization vectors, tensors for the vector field and for the tensor field. So everything I can I'm going to tell you can also be applied to, to search for a uh, parity um, break correlation. So what we did in this paper, the product of this paper is the minimum variance estimator for coupling for such couplings to the field. And it's pretty straightforward. We start with this equation. So this is our hypothesis. Our hypothesis or parameterization is the two density perturbation modes K1 and K2 have a non-zero expectation value that's proportional to this contraction of the two vectors with the polarization tensor, and then some bias spectrum that has some functional dependence on K1 and K2 and the direct delta function. And so what we do to measure this is this, to look for this is as follows. What we do is we consider each Fourier mode of this fossil field, capital K, independently. And then I look at this, this particular frame on this um, tensor field. And then I look at all triangles, all pairs of um, density perturbation modes, K1, K2, that add up to that capital K. And each one of these triangles, each one of these products, gives me an estimator for the amplitude H of K. So I just take this, divide both sides by all this stuff over here, and then each one of these triangles gives me an estimator for the amplitude of the of K. And then if I want to get a better estimator, what I do is I sum over all of these in average. So each triangle gives me an estimator for the amplitude of H of K, and then I sum over all of them in average. And if I want to do a little bit better, then what I do is when I sum all of these, I sum all of them, all of them with inverse variance rate. And so this is the result. As I said, it's a technical talk. But the idea is pretty straightforward. You take each Fourier mode of the field, and then you can construct this estimator. And then what we've done here is just uh, inverse variance weight each one of those triangles by the, we've weighted each one of those triangles by the inverse variance weight to get the minimal variance, minimum variance estimate. And then once you've measured the amplitudes of each of these Fourier modes, then you can actually try to look for a power spectrum, a signal by summing over all the amplitudes of the amplitudes of all these individual Fourier modes with the inverse variance weight to see, um, to test for consistency or to look for a to test to look for consistency with a specific model prediction. So this is straightforward, it's well defined, it's very, very similar to the kinds of non-Gaussian estimators that people do with large scale structure surveys already. All the people look for bi spectrum. Four point pumps is the same thing. All we're saying really is that if you have these codes, if you've got your galaxy survey, you've got the analysis software set up, there's a line in the code somewhere where you have no um, phi dependence, as in the angle dependence. And all we're saying is that if you put a sine phi or cosine phi or sine two phi or cosine two phi in there, you'll get an estimated from scalar vector. So this is a reminder to me. So there was something that happened in the preparation of this um, paper. So as a nominal yeah, example. So um, the fact that you're coupling to the gradients, um, is that uh, pushing the effect of coupling to the much higher decay? Uh, no. How does that appear in that formula where you said all I do is take my F and L code and I make a simple change? Sure, it is a little more than that. Yeah, so this is the this is the form. Is this, this formula the next well the, the HP formula, that one. Uh, so I've uh, uh, I mean maybe it's obvious, but uh, what are the if, if I do the FNL uh king, uh -huh. right, which has got its own estimator aspect, uh, I am doing more than just uh, uh, I, I'm putting in a different K power. Yeah. And so that seems to push the modulation coupling up to higher K, and so that's sort of an interesting feature. Of this is something different. Am I right about that, or am I talking about this? 
Yeah, although, so that's actually swept into the rug here. So F sub P of K, this is the, this sum parameterizes the device vector. Yeah, no, so I, if I, I have a local model type coupling, then strictly speaking, this, these two are our um, unit vectors. So let me go to the next comment. So this is a test to try to plug in numbers for a specific prediction. We looked at the model that said a tensor scale or scale of three point function. And the model of sun tensor scale scale of three point function gives you a specific form for f sub p with these factors in there. And it actually turns out to be a scale invariant spectrum, equal power from all k. Okay. So what happens in that in that particular calculation is that you have equal contributions for logarithmic interval in capital K to the gravitational wave, to the tensor metric perturbation. And then the contributions from small k are similar, but the small k dependence is similar to what you have in the local model. It turns out to really be a modulation of the power spectrum. So what I do is I say that the power spectrum, say in this direction, is modulated versus this direction. The anisotropy in the local power in this direction versus this direction is modulated by the amplitude of the gravitational wave. Yeah, I, don't, I don't quite see how it is that the, uh, that the grad is here from there. Well, if I have a, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll ask you a question. If you're tick on you, get away from so um, I think the item is that uh, if the tensor fluctuations are large enough so that this tensor is getting together a bus factor, it's all going to be observed, then um, tensor fluctuations will also show itself as the grand wave in the power spectrum, the tensor fluctuations. Yeah. Um, is there a lot of examples where um, the grand wave itself can clearly perform these bus factors instead of? So it turns out that with the we sort of use the tensor scalar scalar um, as a toy model to plug the numbers. So if you do believe that that, ten if that tensor field is the gravitational wave, primordial gravitational wave background from inflation, then this would not be competitive with, say, B mode searches for the CMB, unless you went to very futuristic 21 centimeter measurements. So very futuristic 21 centimeter measurements, in principle, if we could, you know, blanket the other side of the moon with radio telescopes and actually measure all the information that we have in the dark ages, then in principle you can improve on CMB and chemo searches by seven orders of magnitude. Um, but if you're just looking at current galaxy surveys and things that we can expect to have in the next 10 years, um, you're not going to be you're not going to be more sensitive than chemo. On the other hand, <coughs> suppose that this tensor field is some other spin or suppose it's not a tensor field, suppose it's a vector field um, that leaves no other observational traces, or suppose it's some other scalar field, some scalar spectator field or inflation that leaves no other observational traces, then this could show up in galaxy surveys before it would show up anywhere else. How would a vector field manifest itself this way and not right? Sorry? How would the vector field manifest itself this way and not directly? Well, inflation is this very, very distant magical time in the past. And we have well, all this. That's the question how you get a vector field inflation. I, I don't understand. So, what we're hypothesizing is that there's some other fields that were around during inflation, one of which is a vector field which couples to the input run. And if so, then, and then we imagine that that vector field. We don't know what happened to it. It disappeared. So we're imagining that this vector field has no post inflationary consequences. And one can construct models. You can always construct models that fit all kinds of magical things. 10 to the minus 38 seconds after the big thing that don't survive to this. The most practical physical models that develop vector fields is not that bad thing. It's the bad thing to do with that sort of bad thing. Yeah, so if this is a, a gauge field, it doesn't work. Gauge field won't give you this problem. It's got to be some other type of vector field. 
So you can get this effect of coupling in a, a massive gravity theory with the vector that brings in a math in a sorry, an alternative gravity theory that brings the vector degree of freedom to light. But it's not a gauge theory. So the interesting comment is that if you just take all the sinus tensor scalar scalar and then plug in here, the prediction that you get for the observable is infinite. And it actually scales its logarithm of the duration of inflation. So if you believe that inflation occurred for some n number of defaults, then the amplitude of connection is proportional to that number of defaults. And for a while, we were um, under the impression or belief, we had the belief that this might actually be a way to um, um, limit or test for the duration of inflation. And it turns out, we now believe that that's probably not true, that it's probably a gauge artifact. And it's related to similar things that people talk about, the scalar, scalar, scalar by spectrum, but they're actually subtle and important differences. And Young and Dongwe are very convinced that it's a gauge artifact. I'm like 90% convinced that it's a gauge artifact, but still not entirely. And the reason why the slide says nothing more than an interesting comment is that I can't say anything else right now with great certainty. Can, can I just um, can we just go back to your the slide that had the um, the H uh, delta delta one? That's the only thing I didn't uh, back one or a couple. It was really on this thing. So I didn't quite, the first equation looks like it has too many, you have the power spectrum of H in the top equation, right? You only have one factor of H in the left. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused, I'm a little confused by that. Uh, it shows up in the definition of F sub T. F sub T is the by spectrum divided by some, oh, that's a very good question. No, 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 that's fine. Um, it's in this F sub P. So strictly speaking, this is the bi spectrum. What's usually called the bi spectrum, and we're just redefining the bi spectrum to be power spectrum K times some other function. So the next thing that we start to do, so Leon was a graduate student first year, and he came to me shortly after Tommy and I finished, and uh, he wanted something to do in cosmology. And so I gave him this paper, and I said, well, if we worked out the predictions of this parameterization for a scalar-scalar new field coupling for galaxy perturbations, why don't you work out the CMD predictions? And so he went away for a little while, and he came back with a really long latex file. This is one page, half a page in the latex file. So the idea is to calculate the off-diagonal correlations between the ALNs. I'll show you this in a, in a little bit. So what I showed you is that if I have a coupling of the scalar field to some new field, then the coupling of two different Fourier modes, two different Fourier modes, which were previously statistically independent, now get some correlation. There's now a correlation between this Fourier mode and this Fourier mode. Statistical isotropy in the cosmic microwave background is stated similarly. If I have statistical isotropy, then a spherical harmonic coefficient, ALM, is statistically independent from all the other ALMs. But in the presence of this new field, if the primordial density perturbation is coupled to this new field, then I will introduce off-diagonal correlations between, these, yeah, between the spherical harmonic coefficients, ALM. And so he came and he came back to the calculation. This is a six, this is a three J symbol. This is a 9J symbol. This is a 3J symbol. <coughs> anyway, there's nowhere in this calculation where you should wind up with a 9J symbol. And the idea is that what we're talking about is a three-point correlation function, new field, scalar, scalar. And if I have a three-point correlation function in angular space, you think about it, that three-point correlation function can only depend on a cleft score coefficient or a Wigner 3J symbol. So you all remember back to your quantum mechanics class. In your quantum mechanics class, you learned 
that the expectation value of any spherical tensor operator between two different angular momentum states has to be proportional to the clutch forward coefficient and nothing else. Likewise, if I have the expect angular, if I have an angular bias spectrum, an angular three-point correlation function for three fields, it can only depend on a wavelength of three J symbol clutch forward coefficient. There are no nine J symbols. And the reason the nine J symbols arose is that we've got two scalar fields, and then we've got, for example, a tensor field. That tensor field has some spatial dependence, but it also has some internal spin degree of freedom. So instead of adding three angular momenta for the scalar field, scalar field, and then some other field, we were adding four angular momenta, the spin angular momentum of the field, for the tensor field, the spatial dependence of the tensor field, and then the two scalars. And, then the two scalars. and so what we realized is that if we can decompose the tensor fields that we're dealing with, or the vector fields that we're dealing with, into states of total angular momentum, then the three-point correlation functions in angular space will just pop up. And so that's what we decided to work out, and that kept us busy for quite a while. So this is the point of the total angular momentum waves, and I'm really, really eager to give this talk in front of this audience where people actually do cosmological perturbations, because if you read through this paper and understand it and master the formalism, many calculations that some of you will be doing are made much, 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 much simpler. So this is the basic idea. In standard, the standard approach to cosmological perturbations, we have various fields. Delta of x, for example, the density perturbation amplitude. There are also theories with uh, magnetic fields. P of x, we also deal, for example, with um, um, space-time metric perturbations, Hij. And then the usual treatment of cosmological perturbations, what you do is you take these fields and you expand them in terms of plane waves, delta k, v of k, h, i, j of k, etc. Where these are the coefficients of plane waves, e to the i, k dot x. And this is a picture of a plane wave. It goes in some direction, and the direction that goes in is k. There are two reasons why we do this. The first is that e to the i, k, x, the set of all e to the i, k dot x, constitute a complete orthonormal set of basis functions for scalar vector and tensor fields on three-dimensional space, R3. The other reason why we do this is that everybody knows about Fourier transforms. So we all know how to do this, and we have intuition, and they're pretty easy to manipulate. Uh, before I show you the rest, um, we made a table of all the symbols in the paper, of which we're very proud of. Anyway, what I'm going to give you is just a schematic overview of how this works, and then there are details. I have to say, you know, Kit Thorne was a, a senior colleague of mine for a number of years, and I've been like dying for years to write a paper with a table to emulate it. Anyway. So the problem, though, is that many of our observations in cosmology are done on a spherical sky. And so what you do when you do calculations, for example, of um, C and B temperature fluctuations, polarization fluctuations, U and, you know, parameterized by stokes parameters, Q and U, um, calculations of cosmic shear, where you've got a deflection angle, alpha, that lives on the surface of the two-sphere, the function of direction of the sky, which you can write as a gradient of some scalar field plus the curl of some other field. And you can feel a galaxy cluster in a redshift survey. You have the galaxy density perturbation. So the galaxy density, the fractional density perturbation in some direction hat n in the direction of c. In all these cases, what you do is you consider each Fourier mode, and then you consider the contribution of each Fourier mode to all of the different angular momentum modes, L, for the angular cluster. So we describe these functions that we observe on a two-sphere, T, Q, U, alpha, del, phi, omega, delta G. All of these observables live on the surface of the two-sphere parameterized by n, and their, their statistics are described by angular power spectra that are parameterized by angular momentum numbers f. So for example, there's the temperature power spectra, which you see many plots of, the E, E, and B, B power spectra for um, polarization, or weak lensing maps, you might see power spectra of 5, 5, the galaxy perturbation, you see C sub L, G, G. 
And in each case, what you do is consider the least Fourier mode and then consider the contribution of each Fourier mode to all these different L's. And each Fourier mode contributes to many different L's, which makes the, comp uh, the calculation complicated. So for example, if I look at this individual plane wave, it intersects the sphere over here at a fairly large angle, or fairly low L, or it intersects the sphere over here at a fairly small angle, giving contributions to high L. So each Fourier mode gives you contributions to many different L's. So, what we do is develop a new set of, a new complete orthonormal set of basis functions in which the isotropy and homogeneity of space is made, man made manifest not in terms of plane waves, which are eigenfunctions of the momentum operator, but in terms of angular momentum waves, which are eigenfunctions of, of the angular momentum operator. So instead of writing a scalar field, for example, delta of x is a sum of the Fourier modes of some amplitudes times the, um, the basis functions due to the ikx, we write the scalar field delta of x as a sum over what we call total angular momentum waves. And for scalar fields, it's pretty re relatively trivial although for vector tensor fields it becomes more interesting and more powerful. But for scalar fields, these basis functions are just a spherical harmonic, J sub capital J, or capital sub J is the total angular momentum quantum number, for the radial dependence, and then the angular dependence, the dependence on the direction of the sky, is just a spherical vessel function. So these, we call capital psi, this combination of spherical vessel function in spherical harmonic, we call the capital psi, we call the scalar total angular momentum wave. And then we multiply it by a coefficient delta kjm, which replaces the delta of k. So these constitute a complete orthonormal set of basis functions, a complete orthonormal basis for scalar functions that live in R3, just like that, just as you e to the ik dot x. These coefficients can be obtained through the inverse transformation. Delta KJM, you can also show, is just an angular, sorry, a spherical harmonic transform of all the Fourier amplitudes, delta K, of all different Fourier wave number wave vectors K that have a magnitude equal to this K. Just as the expectation value for the product of two Fourier amplitudes is zero if they're different, likewise, we have, um, we have the statistical independence of these different spherical harmonic, sorry, these different total angular momentum. So these different TAM coefficients are statistically independent if we have statistical isotropy. So the proportion of the expectation value is proportional to delta KK prime, delta JJ prime, delta MS prime. And the amplitude is, again, the same power spectrum that we had before, P and K. What's interesting about this is that if I start with a primordial density perturbation and decompose it into these total angular momentum waves, then any angular observable, any angular power spectrum, for polarization, for temperature, for density perturbations, for weak lensing, deflection angle, etc., receives contributions only from delta KJM of the same total angular momentum quantum number J. J is like the only one L, I guess. Yeah, so the reason why we call it J is apparent in the next slide. So for vector and tensor fields, the idea is similar but it's technically a lot more involved, and this is why the paper has so many pages. So for vector and tensor fields, we have an internal spin, one for vector fields and two for tensor fields. So the total angular momentum waves are eigenfunctions of the total angular momentum, J equals L plus S, where L is the orbital angular momentum and S is the spin angular momentum. So, for example, the vector tan waves can be written in terms of three different sets of basis functions. We, uh, we, we wrote down three different sets of basis functions for paper. So any given vector field can be written in terms of um, total angular momentum waves psi, total angular momentum Jm. Here this A is a tensor index. One subscript A um, indicates that it's a vector field, a la Bob Wald's general relativity book. K is the um, wave number. And then there are three different sets of basis functions we wrote down. There's an orbital angular momentum basis, what we call a longitudinal transverse basis, and a helicity basis. So in the orbital angular momentum basis, the three different, well, let me step back. If I have a scalar field, then 
each point in space-time has associated with it one number. If I have a vector field, then there's a vector at each point in space that points in some, in some direction. And that vector is parameterized by three numbers. And so a complete orthonormal set of basis functions for a vector field has to have three different sets of basis functions. In this orbital angular momentum basis, we describe these three different basis functions in terms of orbital angular momentum L, where L takes on three values, J, the total angular momentum, and then J plus or minus one. We also wrote down another set of basis functions, which we call now longitudinal transverse basis. And in this basis, we decompose the vector field into a curl component and a divergence component. So you know that any vector field can be written as the gradient of some other scalar field and the curl of some other vector field. So in this basis, we have three different basis functions, sets of basis functions, L for longitudinal, and then E and B for the analogous things that we have in C and B polarization. So here, L is a longitudinal, uh, a basis with a longitudinal component of the, of the vector field. So these are curl-free, and then there are the two curl components, or the two divergence free components, which we call E and B. And then finally, there's a helicity basis that we write down that represents any given um, field, vector field, in terms of divergence, sorry, in terms of uh, longitudinal components, and then the two transverse components we write in terms of a right and left handed helicity. And each of these sets of basis functions becomes useful in different types of calculations. So for tensor fields, it's similar, but now we have five sets of tensor fields for each total angular momentum. So, there's an orbital angular momentum, again we have three different sets of basis vectors. There's an orbital angular momentum basis where we write the, an arbitrary symmetric trace free 3 by 3 tensor, which has five components most generally. In terms of five orbital angular momentum states, 0, plus or minus 1, j plus or minus 2. There's a longitudinal transverse basis where we write them in terms of a longitudinal component, uh, a transverse traceless E, transverse traceless B modes, so and these are the two um, spin 2 or tensor modes, and then these are the two um, spin 1 or vector um, parts of the symmetric trace free tensor. And then there's also a helicity basis where we write this um, spin 2 field in terms of uh, the five um, helicities, m equals 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. And again, each of these different sets of basis functions becomes useful in different types of calculations. So the plus and cross are we in all three columns you do that as the last one? Yeah, this is plus and cross. This is like some both. combination of plus and cross. Yeah. It's actually better than plus and cross. The thing that's bad about plus and cross, actually makes me ask the question. So the thing that's about bad about plus and cross is if, uh, if I'm looking along the direction of the perturbation, then plus looks like this, and then cross looks like this. And then if I rotate by 45 degrees, I find that plus and cross get converted. So there's nothing special about plus and cross. Here we take those two modes, and we break them up into TE and TB. And TE and TB actually have opposite parity. So there's actually a physical distinction between TE and TB. They can't be rotated into each other. How can that be in the lifting left? Are you going to say left and right are different other than me having two hands? Yeah. Right and left are different. Well, it's because I, I, chose, I chose to label one left and one right, and then it's that way it stops. I mean, all, all our theories are, you know... Is this my right hand or my left hand? <laughs> well, that's because we've broken, you know, uh, yeah, what, what, uh, of, uh, what does this mean that's neutrino then? Well, that's an explicitly p-binding theory, but unless you're dealing with explicitly p-binding theories, it's the same. That's the other advantage, so we do have to compare it. So you can, you can deal with um, p-binding theories. That's another advantage of this formalism. Um, parity violation is made manifest um, very obviously in this one. This is another paper I, I wanted to write that with. All of a sudden, I've got this paper, recent paper from last year on um, tensor, 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 three point correlation function. The parity violation part will pop out when you write it. When you write it, when you expand the branch and the action in terms of the correlation of the point, it's got to be like this. So, <coughs> This is a summary of what I've said. Total angular, weight, total angular momentum weights are scalar vector and tensor value solutions to the Helmholtz equation. 
where eigenfunctions of 3 d Laplacian of eigenvalues minus k squared that are also eigenvalues of total angular, sorry, we should also say eigenfunctions. These are also eigenfunctions of total angular momentum as it has to be. So a few frequently asked questions and answers. These are not scalar vector and tensor spherical harmonics. Scalar vector and tensor spherical harmonics are a complete are complete sets of basis functions for scalar vector and tensor fields um, that live on the surface of the two sphere. These are actually sets of basis functions um, for sets of bases for functions that live in three dimensional space. And they cannot be written as the product of a spherical harmonic and a radial eigen function. If I take a, uh, a tensor spherical harmonic, say an E mode, an E tensor spherical harmonic, and multiply by a radial eigen function, I do not get the tensor family. Although they can be projected onto spherical harmonics, so you can take um, the vector scalar tensor cam waves and project the components, the different components onto the different components of the, 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 the spherical harmonics. And the other thing is that um, what we've done here is not the same as what was done in the 1997 blue-white paper with similar type of It's a completely different story that we've done that we're just completely different. So, many of your theorists don't work with data at all, and you know that when you derive a nice set of equations, just the, the action or the accomplishment of latex makes you feel good about yourself. So likewise, I don't have any pretty pictures to show, I haven't discovered anything. What I have to show is the equations. And this is one of the equations from the paper, and the reason I show it is actually for the following reason. So on the left here, I have the five TAM waves for a tensor perturbation. So this is the TAM wave for the longitudinal component of the tensor perturbation. This is for the two, uh, this is for the vector E mode and for the vector B mode. And then these are the two um, total angular momentum basis functions for the TE and TB components of the spin two or tensor part. And then on the right hand side, I projected them onto um, spherical harmonics. So this is the standard longitudinal tensor spherical harmonic. This is the standard TE spherical harmonic, tensor spherical harmonic, which you're familiar with from CMB studies. This is the, sorry, this is the E mode tensor spherical harmonic, which you're familiar with from, spherical, from, from CMB. Those of you who do weak lensing will deal with vector spherical harmonics for the deflection angle, which is a vector field on the surface of the sphere. And this is the vector E mode spherical, spherical harmonic. So what's interesting, for example, is that uh, suppose I take a tensor um, E mode TAM wave. That tensor E mode TAM wave projects onto a tensor spherical harmonic, but it also has a projection onto the vector E mode spherical harmonic and also the longitudinal um, vector spherical harmonic or the scalar spherical harmonic. So for example, if I think about weak gravitational lensing, in weak gravitational lensing, I've got a gravitational potential phi, and that's a scalar. And then I wind up calculating from it, with some complicated set of, set of steps, um, a deflection field on the sky. And that deflection field on the sky is a vector field. And what you know is that if I have lensing by a scalar perturbation, it gives rise to an E mode field for the vector, um, E mode vector um, displacement. And here you can see that if I start with a density perturbation, a density perturbation is a longitudinal um, perturbation to the space time metric. That longitudinal perturbation to the space time metric maps onto a vector D mode. Likewise, how is it that a density perturbation gives me a um, E mode polarization? Again, the E mode polarization arises from the mapping of this tensor of this longitudinal or scalar perturbation onto the um, tensor um, spherical harmonic, tensor e mode spherical harmonic. And for those of you who do this for a living and are really scared at these equations a lot, you will recognize this as the um, projection function that shows up in your calculation of angular CMB power spectrum and density perturbations. And this function over here and this function over here you will recognize as the um, 
the radial the radial function, the, the radial weight function that you use to get um, the tensor E mode CMB polarization from gravitational waves and tensor P mode polarization from gravitational waves. So everything that's been done before in some sense is all in this equation. There's another thing that we worked out in this paper that I thought was uh, kind of novel. It's appeared in some of the literature in the past, but it's one of those things that most people I don't think knew about. And we've sort of put it all together and expanded. So what we show, one of the things that we did in this paper is we show that all of the vector and tensor tan waves can be written, can be obtained by applying vector and tensor value differential operators to the scalar tan. So, there are three vector operators here. This is V sub L, V sub E, V sub E. When these are applied to the scalar total angle momentum wave, that those give you the vector value of total angle momentum waves for the L, E, and B mode. And likewise for the tensor modes. We have five differential operators that, when applied to a scalar tan wave, give you the tensor value of total angle momentum. So one of the things that's kind of neat about this, and that may be useful in some places, is the following. If you look at the, any of the standard discussions of cosmological perturbations, for example, uh, Edwards and Cosmological Dynamics, that's like a classic, that's a great article. That's how I learned a lot of this stuff. I think it's a lot of people learn a lot of this stuff. You take a metric perturbation, so a metric perturbation is h mu nu, you can then go to synchronous gauge, just a gauge choice. And then the most general metric perturbation is written in terms of a three by three symmetric tensor, hij. That hij has six components, and what they say in the usual discussions is that those six components of the metric tensor can be written in terms of a trace component, and a longitudinal component, which can be written as some derivative operators applied to some scalar moment. So these are the two scalar degrees of freedom. Then they say that there are two vector degrees of freedom, which we can write as a symmetrized derivative of some divergence-free vector field. And then what they say is there are, there are then two more um, components, which are the transverse traceless components, the plus and cross transverse traceless components. And what many of the discussions say <coughs> is that this cannot be written in terms of derivative operators by the scalar function. So that turns out to be untrue. All six components of this HIJ can be written in terms of scalar fields, as derivative operators operating on scalar fields by applying these five tensor value derivative operators from arbitrary scalar fields. The biggest picture is that it's a matter of, of your, what you call your polarization <laughs> object, which is, I mean, you know, the TT, previously you just put out that I put epsilon PIJ, and you say, I say P, I call P equal to T, and like, why it's like and both components, right? Say that again? So when you, in your previous section, in the example you gave, uh -huh. you had this HIJ decomposed into polarization states, uh -huh. which you labeled epsilon. That's right. And this one you call it P, 0, P, V, and uh -huh. P, and got X, whatever right. Right. you call that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, and um, I thought, isn't that analogous? Because in the other paper of yours, you would just um, have expressions of this epsilon in terms of legacy beta and other things which is true are not gradients of objects, but nevertheless fundamental. So you can, yes. you, you can try to do that, but it's not vocationally invariant. So the derivative, so for example, it comes back to this. In the Fourier representation, the two polarization states are plus and cross. And I can't write a derivative operator because of a uh, uh, derivative operator, which one I apply to each of the ik dot x is going to give me plus as opposed to cross. That's good as pickle. Uh, that also is, that's a little bit easier, but also a problem. This, uh, I don't know, I've never seen this before. It turns out that you can write all six components. Well, there's the trace, and then the other five can write some of the derivative operators. Rotationally invariant derivative operators. So, one application I've already discussed for a little bit. So, Greek gravitational lensing. 
and we calculate a deflection angle on the sky. Alpha is a function of the position of the sky. And this you usually decompose into vector spherical harmonics, E mode, vector spherical harmonics, D mode, and vector spherical harmonics. And what you will know is that um, you get the E mode from both density perturbations and gravitational waves, but the mean D mode only from gravitational waves. So density perturbations give rise to gravitational lensing because the deflection angle alpha is just the gradient of a projected potential or on integral line, line of sight, the gradient of some potential, which is a scalar field. So, phi is a scalar field. Alpha is a vector field that's obtained by taking the gradient of the scalar field. So from that, we infer that alpha is a longitudinal vector field. And that's why each density perturbation mode of the total, total angle momentum um, density perturbation mode contributes to the E mode of the vector spherical harmonic, but not to the B mode. It comes, as I showed you in the previous two slides, um, from the projection of the longitudinal vector perturbation onto the um, E mode spherical harmonic. Lensing by gravitational waves is a bit more complicated, but still a lot simpler than standard. So the Fourier representation we know that the expectation value of the square of h plus of the amplitude of any gravitational wave, any plane wave, is p plus. It has to be equal to h cross, the expectation value of h plus squared. And so we call both of those p plus and p cross on one half the tensor of gravitational wave power spectrum. In the total angular momentum wave representation, you can show that the expectation value of the tensor um, e mode and tensor B mode are the same. So a stochastic gravitational wave background has equal contributions of E and B mode total angle momentum waves. And then the E mode spherical harmonic for the deflection angle, this thing here, arises only from the E modes of the gravitational waves. And the B mode spherical harmonic arises only from the B mode of the and you can show. You can also imagine constructing a realization of a gravitational wave background that has only E modes and not B modes. But that would be um, a violent statistical isotopy. It puts us in a preferred place to be in the That looks good if you will place the deflection angle by shear testing. Or the what? You will place the spin one deflection angle by the spin two shear testing. You see what's got a gap in it? Uh, yes. Yes, the shear tensor, yes, the lensing shear tensor yeah. on the surface of the sky. Yeah. Um, you get contributions to E mode from oh, only a few E modes, and contributions to E modes from only a few E modes. So, the motivation originally was um, angular bispectra, and we worked that out in the second paper. So, usually, papers on the bispectra are, the bispectra are given in Fourier space. And what we've done in this paper is show you, give you a formula that takes the bispectrum that you're usually given in Fourier space and gives you the bispectrum in total angle momentum space. And then the wave director theorem tells you that once you've identified the proper total angle momentum states, the three point function for any three fields, scalar vector tensor field, has to be proportional to the wave director 3j symbol for those three j's, j1, j2, j3, j1, j3, 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 j3 times some function of f of j, some function of f of j on j, two, j. So once you have these total angular momentum wave by spectra, the observable by spectra just result from projections of the total angular momentum waves onto the relevant uh, scalar vector tensor spherical harmonics, depending on the observable you're looking at. Scalar, say, temperature, or Stokes parameters Q and U, or deflection angle of the So for example, all of a sudden it's got this three-point function, tensor scalar, scalar three-point function. It's written in Fourier space. It's got the following form. It's got some bispectrum, B of K1, K2, K3. In terms of total angular momentum waves, it's some phi, 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 K1, K2, K3 for the three different wave numbers, and then total angular momentum quantum numbers J1, M1, J2, M2, J3, M3. This turns out to be equal to the same bispectrum 
and under some um, integral, overlap integral for the three different total angular momentum that it states, which is the position. And one of the things that we provided for the benefit of the reader is an evaluation of one of these overlap integrals for all the overlap integrals for scalar vector tensor. And they're straightforward, nasty calculations, but once they're done, they're done. And then you never have to do them again, and you've done them for you. So for example, this is what they look like. They're nasty formulas, but trust me, better to read them than for you than you have to do it yourself. Someday, I'm hoping one of you will think. <laughs> So another application is the CMB predictions for fossil fields. Remember I showed you at the beginning that horrible formula. That was just one micro page from that whole set of notes that Theon wrote down with three J symbols and 12 J symbols and God knows what. And now that we've finished this paper, we can just write down the answer. And this actually is a really short paper with very few equations because we can just refer back to the results we derived from the more general treatment. So the interesting thing of this paper, so here we're calculating, we're discussing the CMP predictions for fossil fields. So remember, if I had a three-dimensional galaxy survey, I told you that you could geometrically deconstruct non-Gaussian entities through scalar vector and tensor fields. That's not the same on the surface of a two-sphere. The reason is that the two-dimensional sky is a two-dimensional surface. And a projection of a three-dimensional scalar vector, the projections of of three-dimensional scalar vector and tensor fields onto two-dimensional surfaces um, are not, do not give you three different geometric things. I don't know if I said that right. If my observables live on the surface of a two-sphere, I don't have the same geometric um, power that I have on three, three spatial dimensions. So what you find is that vector and tensor fossils produce odd carry bipolar spherical harmonics. Does everybody know what bipolar spherical harmonics are? Getting late. If you want to know, I have words to Anyway, bipolar spherical harmonics are actually late. So, ALM, this is, these are two spherical harmonic coefficients for temperature map. In the usual statistically isotropic theories, the expectation of two of them are zero unless they're the same. And then the variance of any individual spherical harmonic coefficient is the power spectrum, temperature power spectrum. If I have departures from statistical isotropy for non gaussianity then that can induce off diagonal correlations between different ALMs. And these bipolar spherical harmonics, these capital A's, are a way to decompose these off diagonal correlations into modes of total angular momentum J and N. And then, these bipolar spherical harmonics can be decomposed into even parity and odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics. The even parity bipolar spherical harmonics have L1 plus L2 plus capital J even. The odd parity ones have capital L1, sorry, L1, L2 plus capital J even, sorry, odd. Turns out that vector and tensor fossils can produce odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics just as they can produce B modes in C and D. And they also produce even parity. The scalar ones only produce even parity bipolar spherical harmonics. So odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics are a signature of coupling to of the equipment to vector and tensor fields. But you cannot distinguish vector and tensor fields from the CMB geometric. And then there are a number of other applications. I won't go through all of them. We're writing a paper now on redshift space distortions and wide angle surveys. <coughs> When you talk, when you usually hear people talk about redshift space distortions, um, you look along some line of sight, and then you consider a Fourier mode transverse to the line of sight. But now if I have a wide angle survey, I look at this line of sight, I look at this line of sight, that transverse Fourier mode is different than this transverse Fourier mode. So what do I do? So in the Fourier analysis, the standard Fourier treatment, you have no idea. But the total angular momentum waves the decomposition into radial and transverse components perfectly there. So we're doing that. Um, this one I already told you about, this is the old slide. Um, I think I told you about this. Um, there's a paper by Maldacena on parity violation in tensor, 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 three point correlation functions. In terms of Fourier modes, it's a nightmare. In terms of total angular momentum modes, it'll be um, a moderately bad dream. Um, Sam Lee 
And Princeton is thinking about applications of this formalism to dark matter detection. And I've also been thinking a bit about gravitational wave detection. Um, Aina Flanagan, who some of you may know from Cornell, he wrote a paper with Laura Book, who some of you may know, um, on lensing of quasars by the gravitational wave background. And again, her paper decomposes the lensing deflection angle in E and B modes. It's a really long paper with lots of complicated formulas. But they found this miraculous result numerically at the end that the E mode and B mode contributions were the same. And he emailed us and asked whether it was possible to see that easily in our formalism. And so the young emailed back the next day with a nice um, one-page derivation of the result in total and momentum ways. So the quality of the E and B mode in that case just popped right out. So this is a summary. Conclusions I told you about cosmic fossils, which are new fields that we hypothesize may have existed during inflation and that couple to the infoton. And what I told you is that simple um, generalization, so the standard estimators people have for non-Gaussianity can be generalized to geometrically decompose um, non-Gaussianity into the forms that would be arise from a uh, company to scale of vector to tensor field. And then I told you about total angular momentum waves. I showed you lots of equations, which are still only a tiny fraction of all the equations that I could have shown you, um, had we had 48 or so hours. Um, it's a long paper, but lots of indices, lots of formulas. I believe that the vast majority of them are correct. <coughs> As I said, it's a, a really, it's, it's a long, they're long and difficult papers, but if you work with cosmological perturbations, um, I think it may actually be worthwhile to to work through. As I said, every day the paper appears in archive and they say, oh, we could have done that totally no mental, but it's much more easy. So, any applications? I hope we will go this evening and have some free time over the weekend to browse these papers and tell us if there are additional applications that we Okay, thank you very much.